Andrew, you and I have friends who are scientists who believe in God and friends who are scientists who do not believe in God. Both groups feel passionate that when you look at the evidence, the universe, it obviously conforms to the view that I have. Either it, there is a God or there's no God. That if there were no God, the universe would be exactly the way it is. And those who say, you, if there were a God, it would be. How can that be? When we were kids at school learning maths, uh, we had a brilliant maths teacher who would never allow us to use the word obviously. <laughs> if ever we said it obviously follows that, he quickly detected it meant we couldn't see how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very wary of uh, anyone who says obviously. Uh, in, in my lab, we have a rule that in a paper you're not allowed to say the data clearly shows something. <laughs> uh, as you say, um, we've each got friends, uh, some of them very distinguished scientists, many of them deeply thinking people, uh, who uh, do not believe in God. I could rattle off some names and you'd recognize several of them. And uh, I also have friends uh, who are scientists of just as great distinction, who um, uh, are committed believers in God and in many cases committed followers of Jesus Christ. And from those two observations, I deduce that you're not going to work this out by looking at scientific data alone, and you're not going to work it out by looking at the uh, natural world alone. I think there are some pointers, um, uh, and that's what they probably are. But I think that uh, most people uh, either choose not to have a relationship with God, or to come into a relationship with God for other reasons. Maybe one or two of them are driven by scientific considerations, but not very many. I think mainly they're driven by other considerations. So I find it actually much more fruitful to say, once you've decided on other grounds, which way you're going to live your life and who you're going to follow, what then are the consequences of what you learn about science? And um, for the, the person who knows God, science can hugely enrich their relationship because uh, uh, such a person is discovering how someone who he knows does things and makes the world work. And uh, if you'll allow me uh, an analogy with, with uh, a friend, Roger Wagner, um, who's a very, very distinguished painter. Many people who don't know him at all enjoy his paintings. They're fabulous paintings. Many people are inspired by them and deeply moved by them. I similarly love his paintings and greatly enjoy looking at them, but, but I've got an extra dimension of pleasure because it's pleasure in the context of the relationship with the creator of the paintings. And uh, maybe that's a sort of slight analogy of the way that the, the person who knows God has this extra dimension of pleasure in learning new scientific knowledge and making scientific discoveries because they've got a relationship with the Creator. It's what Johannes Kepler described as thinking God's thoughts after him. Or it's the text that James Clark Maxwell put on the entrance to the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. Great are the works of the Lord, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. If you look at the history, certainly many famous scientists believed in God, but as time has gone on, frankly, fewer and fewer do, at least over the long term, in terms of physical sciences, biological scientists believing in God. And indeed, if you look back at Isaac Newton, who was certainly one of the greatest scientists of all time, he had some very peculiar approaches to God and calculations mm -hmm. and revelations and mm -hmm. all sorts of things yeah, that yeah. we would not think yes. is particularly worth spending a lot of time on. Yes. So the argument is, is that over time that there is this weaning away from this religious thinking and that people today who don't believe in God, they're not choosing not to believe in God. Mm -hmm. They just don't see any evidence 
from their life or world to do so. It's not their choice. They're not saying, well, there's God, I'm going to choose not to believe in God. It's not something that you have a choice for. It's just that whether you really believe it or not, it's not something that, uh, that, is, um, that, that you can impose on yourself. Well, I, I do think you have a choice, actually. Uh, and I think some of my contemporaries uh, do make a, uh, a conscious choice not to believe in God. It happens I sometimes cycle past Richard Dawkins' house because he's a neighbor of mine on the way to the lab. And he has chosen not to believe in God. That's not, you know, that was a choice that he made. Um, but I'm not sure, what does that mean? He, he, he doesn't think there is a God. Or, or, he doesn't think that they had equal weights and I'm going to choose not to believe in it. He just doesn't see any reason to believe in God. Is, is that a choice? I think that we each of us make choices on the basis of the evidence available to us. I, I don't agree either with what you said about uh, a trend. Of course, it's a trend that less people go to church now than used to be the case, at least in the industrialized northern world. It's not mm -hmm. actually true That's worldwide, true. but it's true in the, in the world where perhaps some of the elite universities are. Um, at Oxford, we don't find the truth by voting. <laughs> you know, we try to have other better reasons for choosing what we're going to believe than just what everybody else thinks. Uh, though what other people think may tell you something, so it does matter. Uh, as far as the trends go, you're quite right that Isaac Newton was a very complex person. I'd sometimes come like to be as complex as that myself <laughs> if I could come up with such good science as he came up with. It was undoubtedly science that was religiously motivated, albeit, as you say, in a somewhat idiosyncratic way. But there have been plenty of scientists since then um, who have uh, done brilliant science, who have had a much more uh, orthodox Christian faith. One might think of James Clark M Maxwell, uh, or I could mention some living scientists, some of the names you would recognize, who uh, have a strong faith in Jesus Christ and who do science that is brilliant by the highest standards in the world. So, um, uh, although, you know, the proportions and the percentages may be changing, uh, you simply can't say that there are no good scientists who believe in God or no good scientists who believe in Jesus Christ. That's not the case, uh, quite the opposite. So let me put you in the position of a great scientist who believes in God, and you look at the, the fact that the many people, do, many scientists do not, some do. What does that say to you about the God that you believe in, that the universe that that God created, the one that you believe in, is such that many scientists can, can look at that and say that that's evidence that God, there is no God? What does that say about the God that you believe in? Um, let me try and focus on your very specific question. What does it say about God? And what it says about God is that he is love, and that he loves, and it is um, a property of love that it risks being rejected. Otherwise, it's not love. So. Uh, it tells me about God that he loves with a love, the only kind of love there is, that risks being rejected, and in some cases it is. 